I am going to talk to you about OPS and cell patterns with Python, but this is a very, very introductory um, course. Uh, so we're going to uh, start some like a little bit in the fundamentals uh, and we will move to a little bit of image processing and then we finish with the actual uh, optical pool screens. So before I, I go further, let me introduce myself. I'm Sergio, I'm Sergio Leab. I'm a bioinformatician and data scientist with Procovia. It's a consulting firm uh, based in Vancouver. I am based in Ontario though. Um, I have a PhD in biochemistry and molecular biology from the House University in Halifax. Uh, and I did a couple of uh, postdocs in McGill in Montreal. Uh, feel free to contact me through LinkedIn. My handle is J-S-H-L-E-A-P. And my email is sergio.leap at procogia.com. Oops, I have a, a typo there, it's .com. So let's get started. So before, before we dive into it, can I have a show of hands of who is fully functional on Python and who is not? So let's say, let's um, ha hands up for who never used Python before. Never used Python before. So I don't see it. Okay, so there are at least a couple. So for those that are already um, comfortable with Python, then probably this first part is going to be a little bit of what you already know, but I want to bring everybody into, um, uh, into uh, up to speed. So we're going to cover from what's a variable to uh, a little bit of um, uh, functioning, like functional programming. Okay, so bear with me, the ones that already uh, are very comfortable and the rest, like, let's uh, dive into it. So the learning objectives for this part is interact with the Python in interpreter. So I would recommend that you have a second screen or, 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 a, or a second uh, tab with a Python interpreter or with the uh, notebooks that are in POSIT uh, cloud. Are we going to understand what a variable is, how to set it up, how to manipulate it? We're going to go with some of the data structures like list, tuples, and dictionaries. Uh, and then we're going to have um, to how to read and manipulate um, uh, data uh, in, in Python. Also, we're going to do some uh, loops and, and how pure, pure functions work. So the first thing is why Python, especially in an R form uh, context. So why Python? Well, we also branch out to Python. Like me personally, my personal uh, belief is that you have to get the right tool for the right job and not because not everything is, is a nail, right? So um, when you have a hammer, everything looks like a nail. Uh, Python and R and any other of the of the programming languages have their very particular, um, sorry about the notifications, I need to sort those out. Um, have very particular uh, usages. Python is one of those that have been used a lot for AI, machine learning, uh, and a lot of uh, image processing as well. So it's uh, in your advantage to also know uh, a lot of Python, which is uh, used for uh, data science, uh, AI, et cetera. So first of all, we have multiple ways to interact with Python. One is the Python terminal. So if you are in a terminal, the terminal is, uh, is like, uh, yeah, like I'm assuming that you most of you know what a terminal is. Uh, you just type Python and you're going to have the console directly into it. This one is a very basic console. So I would recommend actually, if you install IPython, uh, that's a more, much more feature rich uh, interpreter. So Give, give it a try if you want. Uh, and there are many, many others. Uh, uh, Jupyter Notebook, for example, is what this is running on and is what uh, uh, we have in POSIT Cloud. Now, let's start with what a variable is. So variables basically are ways to store data into the memory of the computer so you can interact with it. So for example, let's say that I want to store some numbers in Python. So I say a number is going to be is equal, this thing is not working for me. That's great, equals. Why equals not working? Hmm. My equal is not working, so I'm not entirely sure what's going on. So I'm going to escape here and see if it works. 
this is not good because most of my presentation re relies on that. So let's go to this one and see if I can. Okay, so let's say uh, I apologize for the thing. Uh, for some reason, Rice is giving me some errors with the equals. So you can store, let's say, a particular uh, number, and then you can print that number directly to the console, right? You're just storing that uh, variable, that thing into a variable. And the variable right now, we're calling it A, okay? Um, then you can, you have different types of variables, okay? so. This one is going to be an integer, right? So, and how do we know uh, what type of variables? In Python, we can have the type function, right? So if you, for example, instead of type typing the number 10, you type the string A, the string normally R in between quotes, right? Um, then you're going to have a string and you can check the type by uh, using the function type. So if we change this now, right? You're going to see, that is an integer, okay? Uh, there are multiple different um, uh, types of uh, variables in Python. So for example, if you want a float instead of an integer, so float will be the decimal point, point uh, things, then you're going to see that this one becomes a float. Uh, and we also can have Boolean operators. Booleans are the ones that are true or false. So if you have true, in Python, true and false, when it is starts with a capital, is going to be a, 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 a keyword that exists already, right? That's why I changed the color right there. So that's a Boolean, right? If you type true like this, it's going to give you a, a that is, name is not defined because this is um, assumed to be a variable that you have not defined yet, right? But true exists as, a, as an object and therefore it becomes a, a Boolean, okay? So I'm going to go real quick because there are not many people here that uh, are not very familiar with Python. So I'm just going to go uh, real quick. If you want me to uh, stop in, in, in something in particular, please raise your hand or communicate with uh, the host. He will let me know to go back at it uh, in a little bit more, um, more detail. Okay, so let's get started with that. And then the first uh, poll, so if you can put the first poll, uh, it's simple. What would happen if, with this? If too many people fail, then I explain it further. If nobody people, no one fails, then I'll just move on. Right, so there are a few that are saying error, and that's a very good thing. So let's uh, check it out. So in Python, we have ways to actually um, define something multiple times, right? So like if we run this one, whoop. okay, so I'm going to share the results. Okay, so I'm going to stop sharing. Now, in this case, for example, when we print that, this will print us everything, but so let's go back to the thing. So when we have A equals uh, 10, but then we also add an extra layer right here, what this is going to do is that it's going to assign this value to both of the of the um, variables, right? So if we print A and B, we're going to see that they both are. So there's something I'm not going to get into more detail about it, which is there in Python pointers work a little bit different than in lower level um, um, languages. So it's not going to be, um, like there are going to be some issues that you're going to face later on with more complex objects, but for integers, strings, and all this uh, stuff, you don't need to worry too much about it yet. Uh, but be, bear in mind that there are some issues that might uh, arise from it, but there is not going to give you an error. It's actually going to assign both to uh, the same thing. Okay. Now you can actually modify the type that's called casting. And you can do that. Most of the things that I'm explaining here, I'm explaining some syntax in Python, but the concept behind it is pretty much um, uh, all languages have it, right? Like R, C, uh, Golang, whatever you, you think we're going to have this casting, they're going to have types, they're going to have variables. So this is, is going to be help, helping you regardless. Okay, so transformations are allowed if the type underneath uh, is about uh, equivalent. So for example, if I have 
um, so I'm going to type 10. This we already saw that it was an integer, right? But, so I'm going to print it. But if I do, uh, for example, uh, print float 10, right? This is going to transform this one into another class, which is float. Uh, let's put a type right there. Okay, so you can cast integers into floats. Also, you can cast, so let me actually put a equals 10. So we have an actual variable. And then I'm going to, yeah, let's put it as a float. In this case, I actually can cast a, a string into a float, into any numeric type, if the string has numeric types in it, so has digits, right? Because for example, if I put, say, string in here, a string or whatever, is going to give you a value error. And that value error is because you cannot transform uh, letters into digits, right? So you cannot cast those kind of things. Any other thing that are um, uh, transformable, you can do it um, as is, okay? Any questions until there? I'm assuming it's pretty straightforward so far. Uh, I got one quick note. When declaring variables, do you ever recommend defining the type, e.g., a int integer equals 10? That's a great question, actually. Um, so Python is a type of language that is called dynamically typed. That means that the types of variables are not uh, explicitly required uh, or declared, right? But you can use something uh, as a good uh, practice for programming is to hint what kind of types that you're respecting. And that will help you for many things. We will help you, other people reading your code, it will help um, um, some of the IDEs, the, the debuggers, um, actually catch uh, potential errors that you have. So what uh, SARP uh, is saying is the following. So let's say that we have a variable A, and I know that this variable is going to be a string. So I can actually tell it, right? If I put a, a two points, uh, sorry, a column there, I can say this is a string. This is a function, str in Python is a function that converts anything like uh, 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 the type. It actually type casts to a string, but you can use it also for type um, hinting, right? And then you can give it the value, right? Uh, it's a string, so that's going to be like that. And as you can see, it works just fine, right? But then this one is going to give information, extra information when you're uh, going. So it's a great question uh, uh, that oftentimes we tend to create, to obfuscate our code quite a bit. Uh, and these kind of type hintings will help you a lot uh, in the down run, especially when you, for example, um, um, haven't looked at your code for a long time and then you go back to it. These type hintings allow you to remember easier. Um, along with type hinting, you should also comment your code, like in here, I don't have a particular like set of code, but let's say uh, when we get into into the um, functions, I'll, I'll I'll show you a little bit about doc strings and and that kind of thing. Okay. Now there are operations that you can do with variables. Okay. So for example, you can um, add like let's say that this one is going to be an integer instead. So let's put an integer, and then you can do any mathematical operation with that integer, right? I can add one to that integer. I can um, uh, divide by 10. I can integer division, right? If I do double that, it's an integer division or multiplication, right? Et cetera, et cetera. That basically, um, so let me take this one off. Ah, that's a good question also. I'm going to get it. Right after I explain the operations, I'll I'll get to do to to you. Um, I don't know what your name is because it's Jinx Jinx, but I will go to that. Um, so yeah, in a string still, a strings will work a little bit different. You can also use some of the operations with strings. So B, let's say that is a string, uh, and then let's say that it is a string. Right? 
you can concatenate strings by using operations. For example, I can say B plus B. And this one is just going to concatenate two uh, strings together. You can also create multiplication. So if you multiply a string by, a, let's say, an integer, what it's going to do is it's going to repeat the string multiple times. This might um, uh, help you later on when you need to create repetitions or when you need to manipulate strings in certain uh, pattern uh, way. Okay. There are some others that are not allowed. Uh, so if you try to divide a string by an integer, they don't understand that. Uh, same if you try to divide um, by another string. Division is not something, operation that exists in string type. Now, going back to the question uh, by YINC18, so he's saying that why this, why this will give you an integer? As I mentioned, uh, Python is a dynamically typed language. So here you're just hinting that you're expecting A to be a string. That doesn't mean that the language in itself is going to change it to a string. What is going to happen is, for example, if you have an IDE or, or like a debugger or, so, or some sort, is when you do this, it's going to highlight that there's a, an issue right here. Let's say you're expecting a string, but you're passing an integer and there's an issue there, okay? But the language on itself, since this is an integer, it will remain an integer until you change it, okay? Because it's not a strictly typed. So languages such as uh, Golang or any lower level language is a strictly typed. That means that you need to explicitly say this is an integer and is going to remain an integer for the duration of the program. But in Python, your variables can change types if you want to do that. That being said, you do not want to do it as much as you can. So it, it would be bad practice if you do so. Does that answer, answer your question? Okay, I'll let you get into the, the thing. Okay, so just to recap a few points there. So if you take a, a float and you, ah, that, uh, this is actually not a recap. That's something that uh, I have not explained. So if you have a float, let's say that you have um, 10.5, okay? And you cast it into an integer, uh, it's going to only give you the integer part of the number, okay? So that's what we have in this recap. It's going to be transformed into an integer, but only is going to return the integer part, okay? Um, an integer would also be given a zero decimal when transformed to float. So if you, for example, then retransform this into a float, there is just going to tell you, okay, you just completely throw away the floating point uh, part of the of the number, okay? Only strings that contain numerical values can be casted into a numerical, into a numerical type. Um, and, um, oh, we, we saw a couple of, of comments that I have here, and you can actually run. You can comment code in line by using hashtag in Python. So the same as you can do with different, um, uh, uh, Characters in different languages. In Python, you can comment with things. So this is a comment. And you can see that everything runs perfect. It's going to skip that comment, but it's always good practice uh, to, um, uh, to, to, do, to comment your code as much as you can, OK? And we also saw that Python will give you different kinds of errors. So in here, for example, we have a value error. And it's going to point you where the error is. So D1 is in case it's a value, value error, but we also have type error in this case because the types are not aligned. So uh, Python normally gives you the, the traceback is going to be informative, especially if you are already in Python uh, 3.11. Python 3.12 is even more verbose in, in a traceback and it will give you a lot more information about the errors. So I actually, will encourage you to, to go, if you want to go into Python, to go into a more uh, advanced uh, the, the versions of Python, okay? So let's go for another of the uh, of the little quizzes right here. So which code will correctly print this? 
So I wanted to say, hello, one, two, three, four. Which one code is going to do it? So can you put the poll in? All right, most of the people got it. Uh, so I'm going to just end the poll by there. Um, so for people that were saying a string, a string does not exist in Python. So if you go, uh, let's stop sharing this. Um, if I do a string like this, right? This is going to fail. The string is not the function. The function in Python for a string is str that will convert it. The for float is going to be float. This one is full. For um uh, string for integer is int. Okay, those are the the three basic um uh, variables that we have. But we also have some containers, so we're going to keep going unless there's any questions. So far. I'm going a little uh, fast just because I, I saw that most of you already know this. So I don't want to bore you too much, uh, but I want to cover as much as I can um, on the basic of, okay, basics of Python. Um, if you are already very comfortable with R, you probably already kind of know this uh, intuitively. Uh, and there's just adjustments in, um, in, in the syntax, okay? So let's now talk about containers and basic data structures. Um, so to store multiple variables, so we can have multiple variables in different types, um, we can store it in different ways. And that will depend on uh, the type of, of operation you're going to be doing uh, and what you want to do with it. The first one is going to be a list. And now this is basically a sequence. It's going to be an ordered sequence of elements uh, that you can, um, let me actually go bigger. So. You can see it since I'm not presenting anymore. Um, so you can iterate over them. So in this case, for example, we have a list with multiple types uh, of variables, right? Let's add A here. I want it to be a float. Uh, oh, let's uh, put it a tuple. And I'll explain tuples later. All right, and then when you print the list, is going to print all, all the, the things uh, together. And I'm going to explain a little bit how you go um, uh, through them in a, in a little while, but this is, this is basically the, um, the way that uh, lists uh, work, right? It's just square brackets separated by commas, and then you can have uh, whatever you want. You can have full objects, as you can see. You can actually contain lists within lists. You can contain other types of, of objects. This is a, a tuple we're going to talk about a little bit later and any other of the basic types that we already covered, right? So you can store pretty much anything in the list. Now, how, how you can retrieve uh, things from that list is a little bit similar to R, for example, uh, and there's something that's called slicing. So let's go with the slice, the first uh, element. So here I'm going to print the, the full list and I'm going to return just the first element. In Python, the indexing is a zero index. That means that it's starting zero. Uh, and that's something to keep in mind if you program in different languages. Uh, so as you can see, it will return directly the, the first one. And this is called indexing. If you do the first one, it's going to return the, first, the second element and so on and so forth. Now you can do something that is called slicing. So let's say that you don't need a single element. You want a subset of elements. You can subset or do slicing by using a colon between the indexes. So in this case, for example, you're going to uh, retrieve everything between one and four, but this four is not inclusive and you're going to see. So you get the first, the second element, third and fourth element, okay? So it's going to be uh, in that case. So zero, one, two, three, and this one would be the four, so it's not included. Okay. I'm assuming so far so good. Please feel free. Uh, if I'm doing instead of me stopping, I'm going to just let you write in the chat, uh, and I'll stop whenever you have a question. But please do ask all the questions you want in the chat. Uh, that actually it's pretty uh, useful, especially if you're already a little bit more advanced and you want to know something from this particular thing. Okay. Okay, so to recap, you can construct a list with square brackets. You can retrieve elements by indexing with the actual index number, the integer. You cannot index with uh, floats, right? So if I try to do 1.5, well, it's going to give you a type error because there's absolutely no way that you can wedge half of, uh, of anything there, okay? So 
that's a thing. You can um, print the first element, like the, the elements um, directly, uh, like the full list or a subset of the list by using the print function. Oh, and I didn't cover um, the negative indexing. So let's say that you have a really long list. Uh, and let's say that you don't know the actual length of the list, right? You can also indexing the, the last few by using a negative index. So for example, if I do minus one, this is going to retrieve the last index, minus two, the second to the last, and so on and so forth, right? The same way you can slice. So let's say that, I, that you want from the third uh, to the end, then it's going to uh, start from here and to the end, okay? So that's how it's going to work. Um, another thing that is, uh, another function that is really, really uh, handy is you want to know uh, how long your variables are. You can use len for them. So in, um, in R is length, in Python will be just len. So if you do len, and, 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 and the list, for example, is going to give you that is five elements in, in the list, right? Uh, if you give it an integer, it's going to give you an issue because integers on themselves don't have a particular length, all right? You have to have a container. Same with floats, right? If you go like this. But, and this is an important difference, if this is a string, it's actually going to give you the um, uh, length of that string, okay, in number of characters. Why is this? Because string is a special kind of variable that it acts as if as, as a sequence as well, because strings are a sequence of characters, and therefore under Python it becomes like it behaves like an object and is an object that has uh, um, the properties of, of a list, right, of a sequence. Okay. All right. So now, uh, if there's no questions, let's go to iterating over a list. So you can like be indexing one by one will become very, very time consuming and completely not like a non secretary, right? So we need to actually find ways to go over a list multiple like uh, automatically, right? In Python, like in, um, in R, in any programming language, we have the, fa the famous for loop. Okay, the for loops in Python work like this. So you got four, then you set the variables that are going to be um, um, uh, filled out, and then in whatever uh, iterable you want. Okay, so I'm showing here a couple of things. Let me cut this for time being, but let's say that I, get, I do a four uh, item in a list. Okay, and then I'm going to just print the item. Right, so that will just go over a list and going to print every item. But let's imagine that we want to print every item and its index. Okay, so we can do something like this. You're going to do index item in enumerate a list. Enumerate what is going to do is what it says that it does. It enumerates every single one of the of the indexes, right? That you're finding there. Okay, and then you can concatenate them or um, you can use any other for, uh, string formatting, which probably I'll uh, touch up a little bit later on. Um, are lists with mixed types common in biopharma projects? Yes and no. Um, in biopharma projects, um, you're going to find a lot of, uh, 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 sometimes you're going to find poor code and then you're going to find good code, right? So you're going to find sometimes you're going to have mixed types, in which case you're going to have to check every time that you go uh, for it. But I will advise against doing that. Every time that you are um, uh, having to deal with lists and, and, and containers, try to keep it as um, at the same time as possible, right? If you do that also, later on you're going to see that there are more, um, uh, efficient uh, containers in the in the case of arrays, for example, that if you keep everything the type together, then you can use it no problem and it's going to be significantly faster. So I would always recommend not to mix it, but you do find it in some projects uh, that it mix uh, types. There are some cases in which you cannot kind of avoid it because the the overall list um, 
it's just a, a kind of like a temporary container to move things from one place to another, for example. Um, but for the most part, you can avoid it and you should uh, be avoided. Great question. Okay. Uh, oh, so so I was, yeah. Uh, so then you can enumerate the list uh, and print the, the numbers and the items that you get. Okay. So where are you finding the indentation error? Okay. So if you don't put in the indent, so you are probably used to um, programs that either don't use indents or taps for, for, um, um, defining code blocks or they use square brackets, right? Python doesn't use that. So instead it uses uh, a tab or spaces, right? So let's say that we don't do that, right? So when we get there, it's going to give us a indentation error, right? This indentation error is because it does not know where the for loop starts and when it ends. So you need to give it uh, a way to do that. And a way to do that is just to add an indentation in the block that you want, okay? So in programs like C, for example, you're going to have to have something like that. And then it doesn't matter what happens uh, within it. You can have it, however. But for Python, you do need an indentation. That's what a lot of Python haters um, uh, dislike from Python. Uh, one of the things that they dislike from Python is <laughs> precisely the indentation uh, issues that happen, okay? So that's basically indentation error. All right, so oh, uh, there are also special um, functions that will allow you to enumerate lists, for example, uh, not to enumerate, sorry, to create lists um, or iterables on the fly. So let's say that you want actually, instead of um, instead of uh, a full uh, list that you created, so you could create, for example, um, a list, of list, and let's say that is zero, one, two, three, four, and up to the name, number you want. That's kind of like silly, but you can like go over this uh, index uh, item, right? And then we're going to get this one. But if you need a, a to iterate over a lot of of, of um, uh, numbers, and this the sequence is actually uh, sequential by like redundant there, but like. Uh, there are no missing um, indexes or, or numbers, you can use something that is called range, right? So if you do range 10, for example, then it's going to print 10. And this one is a built-in standard library uh, function that will allow you to create a range of values, okay? So that's part of the recap that we have here. You can print uh, the, the list directly, right? So if I print a list here, it will uh, generate the list, printed the list. But, and this is an important thing, when you create a range and you print it, it actually prints an object. It doesn't print the list. You will need to convert this into a list. The reason being that this is an object that will return the values one at a time when you look. If you want to convert this into a list, you can always use the list uh, casting in which case is going to actually give you the the list. This is going to happen often uh, with a lot of um, of objects in Python. That is that you need to convert them into the type that you want. Okay, so uh, that's something to keep in mind. Uh, now we can iterate uh, and uh, over the index and the item using enumerate, um, and we can do uh, operations uh, within that for loop just like with any other language. Okay. Any questions until there? Okay. So now let's go to mutating lists. So oftentimes we want to modify something given a particular, something happened and you want to modify it. So not all containers can be modified and only containers that are uh, mutable can be mutated, okay? So in the case of lists, so for example, we have here a list of colors, red, blue, and green. And I want to switch to change the green for yellow. So if I do colors and I index the number of the green equal yellow, then uh, you can, you're going to remove the green and put it uh, into yellow. 
the link for this Jupyter notebook. You should have access till the end. You should have access to the deposit um, space. In the deposit space, uh, there are three notebooks uh, that I'll be covering today. I'll put the link to the uh, deposit cloud environment in case you missed it uh, before. Perfect. Thank you so much, Phil. Okay. Um, so yeah, another thing that you can do with lists uh, is that let's say that you want the index. You don't know the index of green. Let's imagine that for some reason you don't know this exactly where it is, but you know that green exists within colors. You can actually, uh, let's say that I do colors, dot index, and then green. What this is going to do is going to find the index where green is in the colors uh, list and it's going to return it. That's basically what happens right here. And it becomes yellow, as you can see here. Okay. So, yeah. Um, in this uh, particular example, what we're doing is we're enumerating over the list. We're printing, right? Actually, let's change it into code. We are uh, printing the color, the index, and we are then transforming it into something different, all right? And that's exactly what happens right here, right? Color red is the index zero, and then there's another red because we just change it uh, as we go, et cetera, et cetera, okay? One thing to do here is like, look at this line right here. They are a, di a little different. This one actually is not needed. There are, these two are a little different, okay? This one, you do format, and that's different than what we did before. We can create the string however we want it and print it, or we can format it. And this is called string formatting. So if you pass square brackets within a string and then pass a format function to it, you can actually fill that out with whatever uh, it is that you want. There is another um, uh, way to do that that is called the F string formatting, which is you just precede the string with an F, and then you can use directly the variables within the within the brackets. I see this uh, thing. You mentioned that not all lists are mutable. Oh, yeah. No, all lists are mutable, but not all containers are mutable. And we're going to see uh, that there are there is one special kind that is called uh, tuple, and tuples are not mutable. You cannot mute, uh, mutate uh, tuples, okay? And we'll see it in, in just a, a bit, okay? Well, this is just more examples. Uh, so let's go to the uh, uh, second uh, container, which is called dictionaries or maps. Like depending on what um, uh, language you're more comfortable with, there are going to be, some of them are called dictionaries, some of them are called hash. Formatting more, okay, sure, I can go back to it, okay? So string formatting, I'm going to put it, let me have it here. So there are multiple ways that you can uh, format strings. You can do the simplest one will be like, let's do format it. It would be, you have a string. Uh, uh, so let's say variable is A is equal to string. B is equal to uh, can, and then you can do a, and then plus b, plus, uh, sorry, plus a, plus b, and then format it. And then you can print. Yeah, let me. Right. Oops. Oh, I'm missing a plus right here. And the last string can be formatted. I didn't add uh, spaces. You can add the space in print, for example. Uh, you can do sep equals uh, space, for example, here. Yeah. Oh, she didn't. Oh, sometimes, ah, because I haven't. I'm going to spend some, that some other time. I'm going to add it right here, the space, if I want to. Plus, then, and then I have the, the format line, okay? This is one of the ways 
uh, is not the most the prettiest, is not the most um, conducive, right? But there are other ways that you can do it. One of them is just formatting uh, strings directly. So you can do this. Uh, you know that you have two variables that goes one after the other. So you just put it like that. And then you have this one like that. And then you use this as a string, as I mentioned before, it's an object. So you can actually have access to some of the methods that that object has. For example, format. And then I'm going to put A and B and it's going to print the formatted line. That's one of the ways. There is another way, which I like it better. I think it's prettier, uh, which is use something that, uh, you know, you can only use it after Python 3.8 though. So don't try it be before that, which is the F strings, okay? The F strings allows you to take these environmental variables and use them directly into, into here. You do need to, um, uh, cover them with curly brackets though. So if you do that, it also going to end up uh, with this formatted string that you want, okay? Is that, co uh, covers your, your question, Neil? Awesome. Okay, cool. Now we'll go to dictionaries. So in dictionaries, in some other languages are called mappings. Right? So basically what we're doing is literally mapping one thing to another, right? One object to another. Normally that um, um, object, like the, the key object is a string, but it can be other objects, okay? So in this case, for example, we have species one, species two, and then we have um, two lists. In this case, it's species count, for example, right? When you do that, let me do that, and you print the, um, the dictionary is going to print it as it looks. That's basically it, right? But what if you want to actually get the particular uh, thing? Then you can use something similar to what we did in indexing uh, with um, with uh, lists. But in this case, you can use the actual key. So you have a key. In this case, it's SPA1 or SP 2 And it will return the values of that key, OK? And those values can be pretty much anything that you want. Okay, um, this is especially important when the name and the value with, with that relationship is important. If you don't care about that relationship, probably dictionaries is not the best uh, way to go, okay? Another thing to take it, uh, into consideration in dictionaries is dictionaries are very, very efficient in retrieving the information if you know the keys, but they're not as effective when you don't know the keys, okay? So the keys should be known somehow. Okay, you should be able to, to subset with the number of keys, okay? Another, thing, another important thing is dictionaries are not sorted. Uh, in this case, for example, like if we put it, let's put it back, it's going to, oh, it's going to just keep the same order that you input the things in, but it not necessarily is the same way because how hash tables work is completely random. Right, so uh, dictionaries are not sorted. Like I don't, do not necessarily keep the order that you input in, and their keys are not going to be sorted by any particular uh, algorithm, okay? Unless you explicitly sort them or use uh, special types that are uh, ordered dictionaries, for example, okay? And you can uh, loop, well, you can generate a dictionary in multiple ways. So let's see a couple. And then you can also loop through them and you can also mutate them. And that's I'm going to show you a little bit of that. So let's say we have two ways to create a phone book, uh, sorry, um, a, a dictionary. One is with the, the one that you saw with these curly brackets, okay? And the curly bracket is going to give you the key and then you use colon and then the value. In this case, for example, I have a phone book. Uh, I have, uh, let's say that Bob and Andres both share the same the same phone number. And you have Stacy, John, and their phone numbers, right? That's one way to create it. Now, there's another way to create it. Let me put this one over here, which is using the constructor. So a constructor has dict, which also helps you to, to cast if you have a list of, of topos, and I'll show you that in a bit. So when you use dict though, this is going to create 
a problem. And I'm going to show you that in a second because the constructor requires that each one of these values to be its own thing. Yeah. I'm missing something. No. So in this particular case, this is not going to be accepted. So the only way to create the dictionary with a tuple will be using that. But let's say that I don't want to, do, to use a tuple. I'm going to use Andres directly. Then my phone book is created normally. Okay. And I, the reason for this is because the constructor will take mappings, direct mapping. So it's going to map a, a internal uh, memory, uh, internal memory address to that particular value, and is going to assign that to as a key. So if we have a tuple, that's not possible because tuple in itself is an object, and it will not like it. But you can create. Um, dictionaries with tuples as keys using um, uh, the curly bracket notation. Okay. So how can you retrieve the the things from a from a phone book, for example? It's basically the same as we saw before. So you just type whatever the key is that you want. Be aware that everything in Python, like in most programming languages, is case sensitive. So Stacy lowercase is different than Stacy uppercase. Okay. So that's something to take into account there. Um, now you can also uh, modify. Yeah. You can also modify the values. Let's say that Stacy's uh, number is wrong. I can actually modify it. Let's say that it was 77 instead of 78, and then I'm going to do the home book. Then it got modified at 77, meaning that phone books are um, mutable. However, mutating um, a key, it's a little bit more difficult. Why? Because it's pointing to a, a, a precisely as a memory address. So you need to first delete that and then um, uh, modify it. So for example, let's say that I want to remove Stacy altogether and add the number of the, the number that Stacy had, right? I want um I wanted to assign it to some other name. Okay. So what we can do is we can use pop. Let me open a new one here. So and then I do Stacy. Is it, but let's capture this phone. And then I'm going to print the phone and the thing. Oh, uh, phone book. Oh, this is worse. Oh, I don't know. Uh, no, this pop is with. Hmm, I forgot how to do this. Okay, but one way that we can do it is we're going to get the phone of Stacy and we're going to do phone book. I, as you can see, I normally never use a pop in, in dictionary. There's a way to do it. I just don't remember right now. Stacy. So I'm storing the phone and then I'm going to delete it. I'm going to delete Stacy from the dictionary. And then I'm going to do a phone book and I'm going to assign, let's say, I don't know, um, Maria. And I'm going to assign the phone that we got, phone book. Here, Stacy, ah, I deleted it already. So let me, I already deleted. Okay, so let's try with uh, this.
So I modify both the keys and uh, the values. So as you can see, modifying the key is a little bit more difficult than modifying the value. Values are completely mutable, okay? Now, the other uh, container that is important, is basic container that exists in, uh, in Python is the tuple, all right? And the tuple is an immutable uh, um, uh, container. In this case, for example, we're going to set it up with uh, just uh, parentheses. So when you have a parentheses separated and an element separated by comma, that is considered a tuple by Python, right? In this case, for example, we're created a red set of fruits, apple and a strawberry. We also define some other uh, avocado and watermelon. So we can actually print them. Uh, we can print index them, for example, just like lists. But what we cannot do for with them is, for example, say green, um, and then say, I think um, uh, zero, I want, instead of being avocado, I want it to be, um, I don't know, sour salt. That cannot be because the tuple does not support assignment. That means that it's mute, is immutable and you cannot change it. And this is very important, especially for example, <clears throat> when you have a set of things that go together and you don't want them to be separated for anything. Here's an example in biology. For example, you have the name of, of genes with the gene count in a particular cell, right? So you want to keep those together at all times. Right, so it's a very important uh, thing to have. So they can be uh, very useful. You can also um, loop over them. You can create slices, right? Um, let me add something else here. Uh, cherry. Oh, let me start. Thing. Um, you can also uh, do slices and you can also enumerate uh, them just like we did before, okay? So some of the of the uh, usability of this is very similar to list, but it's immutable. It's an immutable object while the list is mutable. So how can you mutate, for so to speak, a tuple? Well, you will need to force it. Let's, uh, let's say, right? So we have this and you want to mutate it. So you have to first convert it to a list, right? Then you're going to be red equals to list red. Then you're going to say red zero. You're going to set it up to um, an example, an example, and then you can transform it back to tuple if you want to, to have it as a tuple. That's how we got it, okay? Ooh, I taking a lot more time than I uh, uh, expected here, um, so I'm going to be a little bit more um, like faster on that one. Okay, so booleans are basically what is true and what is false. I already told you that these two are a special things. You you should not use them ever like this as uh, variable names. It always have to be with a lowercase if you want to use as a variable name. Um, Important bit about uh, Boolean op operations is that they will help you with if and else. And we're going to see that in, in a, a little bit more detail later on, but you can actually uh, check if something is true or false and what do they evaluate to. So these things evaluate the variable, right? So if the variable is true, then it's going to go here. Otherwise it's going to go there. In this particular example that I'm giving you here is an empty dictionary and it's going to print false. And why is going to print false is because there's nothing in that dictionary. So that dictionary evaluates to false. The same happens if you have an empty list or an empty tuple or an empty string. They all are going to evaluate to false. There are also ways to do Boolean with um, binary numbers. So basically zero is going to say that is false and one is going to say that is true, okay? You can also use the true directly. So let's say that this is true. So whatever it will evaluate to true, then it's going to evaluate to true, right? Uh, so that's basically the, the usage of Boolean operators. If you have questions, just uh, let it go because I'm 
running out of, out of time and we're not going to have to go to the to the meat of the of the workshop so i'm going to kind of like go a little bit uh faster okay um so you can compare you can uh, ask for things that are within a list we're using the the keyword in so for example if i have um this list here i can say uh, a string in item so a string is not in item because um I've, I'm a, uh, like if I do string in A, so let's say string in the list. So string in A is going to do false because there's no exact string. There's no exact string matching. If I do a string one, it's going to define to true, right? Now I can actually go for each item and ask for if a string exists in any of the of the items. And as you can see, a string, it is a substring right there. So this is going to evaluate uh, to true, this particular thing, and it's going to print that item, which is a string one, okay? Now, I can actually add none, and none is also a special kind of variable. So don't use uh, uppercase none in Python because it's, a part, it's already defined for no value. It's a no value, right? So if I put none there, the string in item. Oh, okay. It's going to fail in this particular case because it's trying to uh, evaluate a none in a in a string, right? So this is going to fail for for that particular reason. So nones do not mix very well with other types. Sometimes this is one of those examples. Okay. Um, but I also can evaluate if B is none. And in this case, I'm saying is, look how different this is. String in item is evaluating if one item is inside of another. But I can also evaluate if the item is a none. So it's a null value. And then it's going to print that, it, that the item is none. Uh, in this case, we don't have it because we cannot, because we are, we're um, uh, processing this. If we have, for example, nones in here, a way to get away uh, with that would be to modify this. So I'm going to actually move uh, this one up. So in this one will never be triggered unless the item is not none, okay? And in which case it's going to work uh, fairly well. So the little tricks that comes with uh, using uh, the stuff. So. You can evaluate um, uh, equality. You can evaluate if, uh, con containing. So if, if one thing is contained into another. And you can do also uh, operations with numbers, right? You can say if something is greater or equal, if something is, um, uh, yeah, uh, equal, greater or equal, uh, smaller than, all the, the numerical operations. So they will evaluate to a Boolean though. So in this case, for example, it's saying is X between uh, Y and Z? And what it's saying is, yes, it is, right? That's basically the comparisons uh, right there. Okay, I'm going to actually skip this just because I am um, a little bit late. Um, so you can also convert between data structures, right? So you can, move from uh, a list to a tuple. So in this uh, in this case, I'm going to not use this one right, right now, but I can have a tuple, right? I don't know, let's put Alice equals uh, one, two, and three, and then a tuple. One, two, and then I can do um, convert the list to a tuple and vice versa. Okay, so we can convert between those two. Now, what would happen if I try to convert directly like a tuple into a dictionary? It's going to not, don't know what to do. Why is that? Because you need a key value pair for a dictionary, okay? But you can generate a dictionary by having a list of tuples, right? So in this case, for example, uh, I'm going to have a one and I'm going to have two and 
free. And this is going to generate the dictionary. So the first element is always going to have just a tuple of two. That's an important bit. Granted, the second one can be anything. Let's say I can have here instead a list of one, two, right? That will also work, but it has to be this great tuple here has to contain only two elements, the key and the value. And the, this list is going to be transformed into a dictionary of key and values, right? Um, yeah. Now, for loops, we kind of like already covered them. Most of you are already comfortable with them. There is a special kind of for loop uh, of loop that we haven't covered, which is while. While basically evaluates a particular um, uh, expression, right? So if you if you use while true, that is never going to end until you get a break within. This is sometimes uh, useful, but it can be dangerous. So always have a backup, like a timeout or something. Otherwise, you're going to have a program that runs forever, OK? So uh, this can be anything that evaluates to a Boolean, and you can modify things. So instead of this being, being true, like while, uh, let's say, um, current number uh, is smaller than 10, then print current number, and then it's going to do that. If you do that, it's going to stop one screen number is is equal or greater than 10. Okay. The same way you can do it with, with true, which is what we had before. So while true, and then you just need to add, add a break to it. This is basically going to go the, to the last iteration. Okay. Flow control, you already saw a little bit of flow control. Flow control is basically if uh, if else, so that's how this goes. So for example, we start here, it's raining, we ask if it's uh, raining, then do something. Uh, if not, then do something else. And that is controlled with if else statements. Uh, and we pretty much already saw them. Um, now we can get to functions. Okay, functions are a little bit different, uh, very similar, but a little bit different than in R or in other languages. So I'm going to cover them a little bit here. And I'm going to also cover something that is called doc strings. Uh, this is a function that uh, transforms um, Celsius into, I don't know, Fahrenheit to Celsius. Fahrenheit, but whatever, transforms into Celsius, let's put it like that. And you can use in here the same uh, type hinting. Again, it's type hinting, doesn't mean that it's going to force the type. To enforce the type, you need to do it yourself. So this is going to be a float, right? You can say a float, can be also an integer, okay? And you can also type the return. The return of this uh, function is going to be also a float, or an integer, right? And then you have your um, function right there, and then you can use it, right? So if you do far to Celsius, and then I say, I want to know what the hell 70 Fahrenheit is in Celsius. So it's going to give you the answer right there. So the anatomy of a, of a function is basically a def statement. So in R will be function, uh, but sorry, in bash will be function, in R I think also. Uh, then you have the name of the function, and then you have uh, parentheses with the parameters within the parentheses, right? And you can have um, a name, uh, sorry, uh, no defaults, or you can add something in default. Let's say, um, I don't know, uh, the statement, and then this one, the default is uh, none, so, so it's pick. So I can add, if statement is not none, then print statement, right? I always recommend you use the doc strings. It's always very, very useful to have the doc strings. Doc strings also allows you to have something, for example, you want to uh, document your code. So you can do param and then temp and then temperature. Uh, to your hand, Fahrenheit, or whatever it is that you want. So always try to use doc string because it will help you later on uh, in coding. Okay. I okay. Uh, scope and lifetime of variables. So 
that's something that differs from, from um, programming language to programming language. In Python, you have local and global variables. Well, most programming languages have local and global variables. Global variables are, are um, there for every single um, uh, thing in the program. Local variables only exist within the scope. So in this case, this would be this bar is only available to this function and it does not exist outside of it, right? So this is uh, how it works. So bar was defined here, which is 100. Then um, I use bar as the Y. And I also use bar here, but it didn't get um, overwritten because of the local and global uh, thing. Uh, Peter just mentioned that uh, the, the, the uh, DocStream also exists in R. It does, and I would recommend you also to use it in the DocStream package. Um, Sarb also says that we, which is more conventional. That's a great question, actually. More conventional are double. It's not also not only more conventional, but it's PEP compliant. So we have in Python a set of rules for being more Pythonic, for so to speak. Like it's not fully enforced. Like I can do with single quotes, right? And it will work just fine. But is not PEP compliant. The doc strings should be with double quotes. Okay. So there's a lot of uh, kind of like soft rules that come with uh, coding. Okay, uh, there's a base problem here since I'm running really, really, really late. So I'm going to leave that for you to go, uh, especially those that are uh, more new to Python to get into it is basically you have a set of uh, genes and species and you want to generate a dictionary and filter that dictionary, okay? so. Go over it, uh, and if you have questions, you can always uh, write to me or ping me. Uh, I'm happy to to help you with that if you're having issues. So for now, I'm going to move to the next um, part, which is um, the image processing. I'm going to try to use the actual presentation and see if I can actually use it. Hopefully, it's not going to have a problem. So in this case, I'm going to just introduce you to image processing. So we already went through a very basic introduction to Python. Now I'm going to give you a very basic introduction to uh, uh, image processing concepts and develop some of the skills uh, with it. Um, and, and we're going to do the same. If you have any questions, please have it. I'm happy to go back to it, but I'm, uh, yeah. So let's get into it. So why is, um, why do we need to do image processing in, in, in bioinformatics? Um, or in anything for that matter, but especially by informatics. Well, it plays a very, very important role, especially when you're uh, trying to uh, cross between microscopy and any of the other things that happen in, in, in um, biology, right? Like uh, you want to sequence, but you also want to know especially where it is in microscopy. So image processing becomes a really, really important uh, um, tool to do, for example, disease under, uh, understanding or to develop uh, therapeutics or to test those therapeutic advancements. Um, so we were going to start like, um, visualizing stuff, right? So images will uh, provide you, first of all, with, with kind of like uh, overall idea of what the structure and behavior of your cellular entities at the molecular level, for example. Uh, and, and you can actually visualize it and that helps you uh, understand better. You can also, uh, by processing that image and extracting intensity patterns, you can also uh, use quantitative analysis of uh, multiple things, right? And do classifications, measurements, and comparisons. And you can automate uh, analysis, right? So uh, what we're going to go through, which is optical pool screens, actually have uh, sequencing happening within uh, a, a, a plate, and you can actually visualize that and, and get the probe that you, that you want. So it allows you to do really high throughput uh, analysis by automating the analysis. It was also facilitating the research by giving you um, uh, the understanding of the drug development or whatever it is that microscopy is giving you. And it allows you to integrate also multiple um, different data and multiple disciplines into uh, a single core. Okay. Um, one of the things that, like, there are multiple. Um, um, libraries that can be used. 
uh, for image processing. The easiest one, in my opinion, is scikit image is not the most efficient though. So keep that in mind. There are other significantly more efficient uh, libraries like OpenCV, for example, but the syntax is a little bit more complex and you need to kind of like whittle with it. So if you want to check it out, uh, scikit image, I, I encourage you to uh, in scikit image, uh, that org. This is basically uh, how it looks. And this is how you uh, install it. So you can actually install it right there by just using a pip or, um, yeah, using pip or conda uh, with your scikit image. All right. They, when you import things into Python, that's something that we didn't cover uh, in the very basic stuff. You need to import some of the third parties. So, so far, we only saw a standard library. You can also import packages just like in R, just like in any other uh, uh, programming language. You can import libraries that you install, you have installed, uh, like scikit image. In this case, is uh, SK image is uh, how you import it. Okay. So the first thing that you need to do is to set up the environment. So to set up the environment, you need to import stuff. In this case, I'm importing NumPy. NumPy is a library, a numerical library. So it's a very uh, efficient library to handle arrays. Uh, arrays is basically a set of typed uh, sequences and they can have uh, multiple uh, dimensions. Okay, so lists, like, you can also make a list of list of lists, but arrays are significantly faster than lists. Uh, the backend of this is C, so it's very, very fast. Uh, we also have in, in Python, like in, in R, you have ggplot. In Python, we have matplotlib uh, to plot stuff. Scale image have multiple sub modules, a lot of them. Here, I'm going to cover just a little tiny sliver of what they have. So you have IO, which is input and output operations to read uh, uh, the, the images. You have for color manipulations, you can also filter using the filters module. You can, they already have data there. You have restoration models, which, uh, modules, which is recovering data on an image. So for example, you have noise, so to clean it up. Uh, and you have morphology as well to uh, deal with shapes in images, right? Oh, let me go back to this one. Okay, so how do you load an image? So in this case, let's... Um, Let's get first with astronaut. So astronaut is part of the data uh, module and you can just load the, the astronaut like that. So let's see how it looks. This is not helpful. So I'm going to just go back to this one. So, okay, so I was saying that astronaut um, when you play, print it, you see that it's an array. So this one returns an array. If you plot this array, plt that I am show, I am show is to plot um, images, or in this case, arrays. And you can see that it plots the picture the, of the astronaut, okay? You can use also I am read to read um, to read um, a, a, a file, right? So in this case, it's a TIFF file that we have in images. You can play around with it in the Posit Cloud. So if you uh, check it out, you're going to see that we have here uh, the microscopy image is this one. This is the shape of it. So it has three dimensions. One of them has six channels, and then it has X, uh, Y, and X. This one has um, uh, X, Y, and channels. The difference is that it really depends on how you structure uh, your format. And there are multiple, multiple formats in, in image processing, right? So you're going to have basically from delivery to authoring, from capturing uh, uh, to creation, right? And this is going to be towards raster images, and this one is going to tends to be vector images. So there are multiple differences, and I'm not going to enter into the, the definitions uh, right here, but you're going to, like, the point is that there are multiple, multiple uh, different um, uh, formats that you want. The one that we're seeing right, the, right here is the TIFF. So this one is a TIFF image, okay? 
So not only we have this traditional photograph uh, uh, and you know uh, raster and vector um, images formats, but we also have modified things to be able to fit what we need in microscopy. So in microscopy, for example, we have a special formats. One is called, for example, OMITIF or OMEE, that is part is part of the of an ongoing uh, open source effort to make microscopy uh, more accessible, right? Because in microscopy, we will going to need not only the X, Y, uh, Z, uh, the X, Y, and channel and the channel um, dimension, but we can also have multiple layers in the microscope, right? You can actually have uh, a different focus of the microscope, and then you're going to have kind of like slices, right? And you can also have something that is called rounds. Let's say that you want to um, uh, sequence in situ, uh, then you're going to have one round per each. Um, one round per, per each, um, no, multiple rounds to be able to determine what is the, um, the, the sequence of a particular barcode that you have in the cells, okay? So the way that the OMI um, uh, formats work is a 5D tensor. And the 5D tensor have rounds in the first uh, dimension, channels in the second, then Z, Y, and X. And it's an important extension because you're going to always deal with different uh, formats. In this particular case, the microscopy that I had here, it only have three dimensions because I, uh, before I, uh, when I store it, I removed the other ones because it only had one cycle or one round and it only have one uh, plane, one set plane, right? So I just removed it and, and store it. And that's how we have there, okay? Now, how can you visualize the image? You already saw one way to, me, to, to visualize the image, but you're going to see, I'm going to remove this for now. You're going to see that if you try to use IM show, as we see some before, with the microscopy image as is, it's going to give you a type error. And the reason is that it does not understand six um, channels, right? Images normally have only three or four channels being red, green, blue, and an alpha channel, right? So since we don't use the colors the same way, then you're going to have um, uh, some issues. So you need to index first, right? So what we're telling it here is that we want the first uh, channel of that particular image. And we're setting it up with a nice title and all that stuff so we can see actually the cells right there. This is called a DAPI staining. So if you are uh, familiar with microscopy, DAPI staining is staining the nuclei. And then you can see all the nucleus in, in the intensities in this particular image. Okay, any questions to there? So we're not, okay. Now you always, every time that you deal with images, you need to pre-process them in order to be able to pro to, to do any downstream analysis, right? For regular images, uh, normally you want to first remove the RBG component because that creates other issues that you, for, for uh, processing the images. So you probably want to do grayscale conver conversion or color conversions in general. The color sub module of scale image allows you to do that, right? So for example, in this case, uh, we're going to transform astronaut from RBG to gray, right? And let's see how it looks. So when you do that, you just remove all the channels and they put it into grayscale, right? Let's uh, do something else here too. Um, the grayscale, that shape. As you see, all the other channels. So if you, if I do astronaut, again. You're going to see that in here we have three colors and here we only have one because it's just uh, black and white. So you have that option of modifying uh, the image and it's going to come handy at some point, okay? Another important uh, thing that sometimes we need to do is background identification or removal. And this one comes very, very handy in, um, in uh, OPS and, and microscopy images, because sometimes you the, the background noise is too high. So you want to remove as much as that as possible to be able to segment the cells, 
So restoration is one of those submodules that have multiple ways of doing things, uh, different kinds of restorations. One of them is the rolling ball background uh, identification and removal, okay? So when you do a rolling ball and you pass an image, it's going to uh, get a background. Uh, you can pass a radius uh, to this particular thing, so that, that would be the radius of uh, the image. Oh, sorry, of the of the ball that you're generating to um, get the image. Okay, so that's basically it. In here, I'm using a, a different uh, 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 data image because it's it's faster. This one just for show right now. So here you can see this was the original image of some coins. Then you can actually identify that there's some. Uh, illumination difference. So the background here is different in the background there. So with background identification and correction, then you can see that is more um, um, homogeneous. So that's um, a thing that will diminish the amount of, of issues that we can find later on. Another potentially useful um, uh, module is filtering. So sometimes you do not want all the, the detail to say that you just want to see the overall pattern. Uh, so for example, in this case, I'm not going to run this because it does take a little while, so I'm not going to take it. But basically what happened here, I have the microscopy image here, the DAPI channel. This is another way that you can fancy index only in, um, in slices or in, in NumPy. It's basically anything else but the first one is going to be the same. This will be the same as doing this and this. Okay. This one is creating a disk for for it to be able to to create uh, the the filters. And then you can you have multiple ways of filtering. You can have percentile, bilateral, mean, etc. And they do uh, a slightly different thing. So the percentile will filter anything out. Uh, that are uh, in between two sets of percentiles that you're passing right here. So the 0.1 percentile and 0.9 percentile. The bilateral mean is trying to um, uh, obfuscate everything that is uh, greater or equal that some tolerance level. In this case, it didn't do anything to the, to the cell. And the mean is going to, given the particular uh, footprint, in which, in which case we have 100, uh, so it's a disk of 100, and it's going to average out everything in that particular uh, thing. And this is the result. Okay, this is the original. Bilateral and original uh, are about the same because the bilateral didn't do um, anything in particular. Percentile, though, and local mean looks also similar. And you can see how you don't see the details, but you see the general pattern. So sometimes it's better for uh, some uh, algorithms to have just a general pattern instead of the the integrities of the intensities, okay. All right. So this is the thing. Um, again, since I'm a little bit uh, over time, I am going to leave you this optional exercise for you to uh, to go through on your own time. Um, and I'm going to move on to the cell segmentation in a little bit of more of the more pharma -y, um side of of this presentation. Is there any questions uh, yet there in uh, basic, very basic image processing? Assuming not. Okay. So participants. Yes. Okay. Okay, let's dive now into cell segmentation for optical pool screen. So probably some of you are, are confused about what an optical pool screen is, or if you are not, uh, then just bear with me for a little while. So basically a pool screen, an optical pool screen is mixing two things. One is microscopy and the other one is pool library. So when you have only a single cell uh, type, uh, then it becomes really difficult to do massive screens of different kinds of genes and different kinds of perturbations that you can do. So instead of uh, focusing on a single um, set of uh, cells, you can actually pool cells and pool different libraries into a single pool library, but still keeping the spatial um, um, uh, aspect 
uh, of microscopy, right? So you're going to have, you can do enrichment, you can do single cell RNA-seq, or you can do an optical pool screen, which is when you have an image uh, phenotype and an in-situ sequencing. So you see they have a, a pool cell library, you can do that, or you can uh, go into uh, matching uh, cellular phenotypes, like shapes and intensities, with in situ sequencing, with immunofluorescence, with fish, or any other uh, molecular um, uh, technique that you need. Uh, and at the end, you can actually have a table with all the features you want and the positions in the in the image and the particular barcode, for example. And that's what we call an optical pool screen, right? And those optical pool screens oftentimes come from a perturbation library, so like CRISPR screenings. Uh, or, or that can be single or multiple perturbations. And then you can uh, add multiple morphologies. You can have cellular morphology, as we as I was explaining here. You can have uh, protein. You can have multiple different reporters, so the reporter genes. You can have interactions. So you can add a particular protein that you know that emits uh, fluorescence when they are interacting. Or you can do fish and do RNA analysis and RNA seq. And interestingly too, you can also check for dynamics. So you can actually have a time step and you just keep um, uh, microscoping like uh, imaging uh, at certain time points. And that will uh, give you a lot of more information and a lot higher throughput than if you had to do it uh, once at a time um, and it will uh, be introduced. So how do you do a pool library? That's uh, basically you just have a, a gene perturbation library. So a docs induced, for example, um, um, set of um, CRISPR um, guides, and then you introduce one per cell, for example, and then you pull them. And then when you pull them, you have two options. You have the existing approaches to phenotyping, which I'm not going to go into it, or you can do the optical phenotyping, which is pre precisely just microscoping, and then you can uh, match the morphology with uh, all the reporters uh, that we have. You can also do something really cool, uh, at least I thought it was cool when I was uh, first uh, seeing about it, uh, which is uh, in situ uh, um, sequences or sequencing by synthesis in situ. What happens is that you actually have the, pro the probes in it, and then you do something that's called uh, padlock extension and ligation. And then you actually go cycles on that one using a rolling circle amplification. And then you're actually going to have spots on each cycle that are going to be A, C, G, and T. And you actually can see it on live how um, the sequencing works. Uh, and you can have directly by having just a stack of uh, images, you can actually say, okay, okay I can call this barcode. Uh, in the in the set of of images. Any questions? Something there? Okay. Now, why is cell segmentation important for optical pool screens? Well, we do have like a bunch of things here, right? We have the nuclei. We have the cytosol. We also have a differential in intensities that can be, for example. Uh, proteins, genes, depending on what technology you're using. Uh, but we also have morphology, and that morphology needs to be extracted, right? Because if I just take intensity of the, of the entire uh, image, well, that doesn't tell me much. So I do need to segment, to actually individualize each one of the cells to be able to say something about it. So in this case, for example, I can get uh, this particular cell, and I can tell, oh, okay, let's see the nuclei and how the nuclei uh, is different than the cytosol in this particular marker. There are some markers that are mainly in the nuclei, some others that are mainly in the cytosol, and there are others that are in both compartments. So it's important for us to know all this information based on, on microscopy uh, and the, the optical pool screen, okay? But there are a lot of challenges in cell segmentation, right? Uh, one is cell heterogeneity, if we have all the cells the same size, or we go here, um, these cells are about the same size, so they're not too, too bad, but there's not always the case. If we have everything the same size, we could potentially filter things that go uh, the same size, or we can do any other uh, thing because we have um, the option to. But oftentimes, that's not the case. We The cells vary in shapes and sizes and intensities in pose and 
And that is not, it is very, very uh, challenging for, for a consistent segmentation. Sometimes we also have, instead of having a cellular um, uh, optical pool screen, we have a tissue, in which case we have multiple types of cells, which further conflates uh, segmentation. It's a, a, a difficult problem to solve. We also so sometimes have overlapping cells. So in, in this case, we don't have that many overlapping cells, but you can see that in this uh, space, uh, it's very difficult to, to tell where, which one is the, the cell that goes on top and, uh, sorry, that uh, is part of the cell on top or on the bottom, okay? We have also noise and artifacts. So oftentimes if a little dust gets into the into the um, media, you're going to see a really bright spot that is not part of that. That creates an artifact. Um, we can also have just a really high intensity background just because the media also have some degree of fluorescence uh, and the filter in the, in the microscope does not allow for like um, anything um, um, to, 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 to remove that, that difference. We also have uh, inconsistent illumination and that can happen by multiple factors. That can happen because the laser hit a little different, the source of light is a little skewed, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So we have inconsistent lighting. We also will have non-uniform background. Uh, that's often the case, especially between the center and the boundaries of the cell. And we also can have a sparse cell density. So we have kind of like clumps of cells instead of having kind of like a, a homogeneous, evenly distributed uh, cell, okay? Questions, question, questions up there to challenges in cell segmentation? Yeah, okay. So how can you segment cells or nuclei or the, these compartments? Well, there are multiple, um, like a lot, a lot of different algorithms. I'm going to just talk about um, uh, four of them, and I'm going to uh, just work with the first one because it's the simplest one, right? So the first one is watershed. Basically, we have a, um, a illumination profile, an intensity profile, and we need to provide um, a threshold, right? So depending on how the threshold is, the label is assigned to a particular set of uh, intensities, right? In this case, the intensity is flipped, so normally it's the higher intensity but you can flip it however you want. That's basically, in a nutshell, what watershed is. It's called watershed because as you can see, it's kind of like a water basin that kind of like floods and then goes into the deep well. And that keeps going uh, for each well up until the uh, particular um, cutoff, okay? This obviously is an oversimplification, but we don't have the time nor, um, uh, yeah, the time to explain it. Now there's other more complex um, methods. Stardis is one of them uh, that uses, and the three of them that I'm going to show, they all are deep learning. Uh, and what they do is that they use um, uh, machine learning with uh, training their models with a lot of different kinds of cells to be able to produce a particular um, set of, of, of predictions. Now, Stardis work, uh, and it's called Stardis because it creates a star from a point from a, a uh, peak point, it creates a star, and that's what it, it starts the, this is the seed for uh, for the next uh, dense um, layer of of, um, of neurons, right? So it creates a dense layer of neurons, and then it deconvolves into the prediction that you want. That's how the starters work. And it does a fair good job, especially with nuclei, with cells, uh, it has some issues still. Cell pose is also another uh, uh, deep learning uh, method that uh, uses manual annotation of a bunch of, of training samples. Uh, and it, and it, it is still, it does something similar to, to Stardis in the sense that it has a point of start and then it creates concentric, uh, um, kind of like, a, um, a gradient of intensity from that point to the edge of the cell, okay? Once that is annotated, that input is, is uh, created to a dense neural network, and then a dense neural network 
um, it produces the output of the masks that are uh, expected. Okay. Mesmer is the last one is called Deep Cell uh, is the company and their cell segmentation is called Mesmer. It also use um, um, a deep learning method, but in this case, I mean, the image classifier actually has to pass first for a dimensionality reduction. So it has, it passes first for uh, convolution with filters. So it filter and at each step is uh, the dimensions are reduced until it, it uh, produces the output uh, in the feature map, okay? So that's basically how it looks. You have a low dimensional representation and then it returns the boundary class score, basically the labels for each one of the, uh, of the cells, of the, the segmented cells. Clear until here? Nobody's asking questions, so I'm assuming we're good. Okay, so now let's go to a, a little bit of uh, the problems that we're going to, to have. One of them is that microscopes sometimes are peculiar. And as you saw before, the TIFF image didn't have any metadata to speak for, while microscopes produce a lot of metadata. So if I try uh, from scaleimage.io uh, import, I am read, and I try to read an MD2 image, ND2 is produced by the Nikon element um, microscope. Right? This is going to fail miserably. And it's going to fail miserably because uh, SK image doesn't know how to open it. Okay? This is something that is not part of what they have developed so far. So they can open any other type of images, PNG, TIFF, whatever but not uh, ND2, which is one of the very widely spread formats in, in microscopy. Now, how can we deal with that? Lucky for us, we already have a library that deals with most of these things. That library is called at image IO. So if you check their um, uh, webpage, you see that it opens OMITIF, it opens TIF, ND2, which is the one that we're going to have. In this case, we need to actually install the particular ND2 package. Uh, so you need to install it this way instead of just the image I.O. And you have a lot of other. And everything supported by bioformats. So <clears throat> if you're not um, familiar with it, bioformats is a really big uh, consortium that have uh, done a lot uh, in Java, mostly, for microscopy imaging. So these bioformats jar is a wrapper around that Java library uh, that reads pretty much any um, microscopy data. Some of them uh, also support uh, cloud uh, reading, right? So you can actually directly read it from, from the bucket uh, in S3 or GCS. Um, but unfortunately, ND2 is not one of them. You, for ND2, it needs to be local or you need to download it somehow, okay? So let's get with X image and let's read the image. Uh, in the two, let's call it IMG. Let's not pay attention to that. It's just a warning that. So when you do that, you see that image is actually a class of an ND reader, and the image is in memory. It says no. Okay, but they didn't give us any image. That is because this is a lazy loader. That means that it's not readily available. You need to call it to, to read it, right? And there are multiple ways to read it uh, with it. I'm going to ask for, uh, so you can ask for the data and the data is going to be a plain uh, array. So this is a NumPy array, as you can see, right? If you type, it's a NumPy array. Right, uh, let's see, let's check the dimensions of this array. So it has five dimensional array with one time point, four channels, one set channel, and then some pixels for X and Y, for Y and X coordinates, okay? But 
I also wanted to show you that there's an X image also uh, gives back some of the metadata uh, in form of an X array. So the X array contains both the array and the metadata. And the way to access it is you just use the X array data. Okay, when you do this, it's going to output uh, the array data with a T, C, Z, Y, X is well annotated. You can see the, the array there. It's going to tell you which are the coordinates, in which case it's just C, Y, and, uh, and X. And then it has a lot, a lot, a lot of metadata. Okay. Let's see all the metadata, what filter, uh, what bin in, etc. the type of microscope, a lot of stuff. Okay. So since we're like 10 minutes to finish, I'm going to, again, uh, there are several exercises uh, within this notebook. Please play around with it. Uh, if you have any issues, just shoot me a message. I'm, I'm happy to help uh, with them, OK? But I will recommend you to play around with these exercises. I gave you two um, uh, images, one in ND2 format, one in TIFF format. Play around and see what problems you find yourself into. That's the best way to learn uh, this particular thing. OK, so in this exercise, I just want you to play around with it, to plot it, uh, and then uh, to slice it, uh, to work around with it, and then find what microscope is used based on the attributes. OK, so one thing that I want that I do want to mention from here is that the attributes that you can see, there are a dictionary. How do you access the attributes? You just do attributes. Let's see what type the attributes are. Is a dictionary. Okay, so you go to the dictionary. You're going to see that you're going to see that the the dictionary keys. The first is just one keys, right? That is on process. So dictionaries can have keys. You can also use the items, but this one is going to output all the items uh, within it, which is also another set of dictionary with the metadata. Okay, so that's how you can access the metadata within all uh, the contexts. Questions will be there? No? Okay. So now, segmenting microscopy image. Um, first of all, we're going to need to know a bunch of stuff. So you cannot just throw the same thing over and over to the, to the problem uh, and expecting a good result because each Experiment is going to be different. Oftentimes, most experiments will contain that channel, but not always, right? So first, the first question you need to ask yourselves is, what stainings are in my image, right? In this particular case, the ND2 that I give you, it has four channels with DAPI is the first channel, up, is the first channel, Cell mask is the second channel, and cell mask is just a cytosolic um, marker to be able to segment the cell. ESR1 is an estrogen receptor one uh, marker, like protein marker. And GREB is a different uh, marker also uh, that is related with the estrogen receptor um, uh, com uh, complex, okay? The other thing that you need to, to check before you start your segmenting, segmenting cell, uh, your your images is what do you need? Do you need cells, nuclei, both, some um, subcellular uh, compartment? That would be a little bit more difficult and that would need a significantly greater um, magnification, which gave me to another one I, that, that is not here. The magnification might be important because sometimes you might need to align between multiple different magnifications and that poses a different uh, set of issues altogether. And last but not least is what features you want to extract. For this particular example, I'm going to focus only on label, the centroid data, the area, the eccentricity, and the mean intensity. Okay. Questions up to here? No? All right. Now, let's identify nuclei with the DAPI channel using watershed. And I'm going to stick to watershed just because uh, is the simplest of them all uh, to explain. Um, is readily available and you don't even need uh, TensorFlow, which is 
uh, sometimes can create problems uh, to to install. Uh, that TensorFlow is, is a library for deep learning. Okay, so this one doesn't use any deep learning, doesn't use anything uh, crazy. Is just basically a threshold uh, of intensities. Okay. So again, we're going to read the image uh, in an Excel array data, and then we're going to select uh, the first uh, cycle, the first set. Uh, um, that I mentioned, and the first channel, which is DAPI, okay? That one will uh, plot the DAPI channel that we have here, right? Um, yeah, and that's the, the first step. We just visualize it. Now you can see that there are multiple uh, different uh, brightness of the nuclei, and that is because the stage of the cell. So a cell in mitosis is different than a cell in um, interface, et cetera, et cetera. So they're going to have uh, varying uh, levels of uh, chromatin exposed to the DAPI staining. Okay, and that's what we're seeing here, right? So the first step that we need to deal with is what would be that threshold? And there are multiple ways of doing it. And there are multiple algorithms uh, to do it. The first quote unquote easy, not easy, way to do it is to set up a particular um, uh, threshold. You just pick it, right? How can we pick it? Well, we probably could uh, plot the distribution, right? So we can do plenty histogram, right? An histogram of the DAPI um, Ravel. The only, the only thing Ravel does is it will unravel all the, the NumPy, right? into a single array, so it's easier for a histogram to plot. And let's use more bins. Uh, so you can check what is the distribution of your intensities. You see that a lot, most of it is uh, low. None of it is zero. That means that we have a background intensity, like intensity of the background is not zero, which is the ideal. And we have also an extra uh, peak right there, right? So we can use this information to pick a particular threshold, but we will need to test it multiple times. And oftentimes you don't have a single um, uh, image. You have multiple images that you have to go into a big, big, um, um, into a big uh, uh, screen, right? You can have thousands of images. So it's not uh, feasible to do it by hand. And um, a single value might not be, um, equal for every single tile, for every single image, right? There might be differences in it. Part of the challenges that I mentioned before, right? But there are algorithms that will help you do that. And all this stack uh, block will help us do that. So let's uh, take it one by one. So let's take first um, the imports. Let's explain the imports. So this is morphology. We already uh, explained it is to get a footprint, right? It just generates a, a connectivity. Connectivity shape, right? Thresholding, this is the one that is going to give us a threshold. And this one in particular uses a threshold called the Lee algorithm. Uh, if you check in the SK Learn, um, that's SK image uh, page, you can, you can see their paper. It's pretty interesting, actually, uh, the way they do the thresholding. We also need uh, something that we already use, which is the filters. We're going to use the mean filter just to uh, filter out noise. So it helps us uh, define better the cells. We are going to also uh, have to identify uh, peaks, right? Peaks in the, in the intensity peaks. And this is the, the segmentation algorithm. <coughs> Excuse me. And this one is a, a, a special measurement tool that SK Image have, which is going to take labels, so the actual labels that we got from the watershed segmentation, and it's going to create a, um, an object with that particular crop out. So you can actually do stuff with that uh, and modify uh, different of the uh, elements from that particular uh, region. So it basically, crops the segmented cells or nuclei. 
And the image uh, is a library that uh, is a scientific library to manipulate images. And we only will use it here uh, mainly to do the distance between the background and the foreground. Uh, so that's this is basically a utility, a utility for intensity manipulation. And then you have NumPy, which is the numeric library. Okay. So that's the, the first part. Simple is just a bunch of inputs. Now let's get to the first one. All right. So let's get the threshold. So we're passing the image there and we can actually pass an initial guess. We can avoid this, but it's always good to have the initial guess. So the initial guess is going to tell where to put, like where do the algorithm think is going to start looking for that uh, sweet spot in the in the curve, right? And here I'm putting a percentile. I'm putting 90 percentile. Why 90 percentile? Because I kind of see a second uh, peak here. We see that this thing goes all the way to here, but we see almost no, um, like very, very few points in this range. So probably that's going to be around 90 percentile. You can plot the percentile in the as a bar if you want to, or you can just play around with it, right? Let's see what it gives us. So this is going to give us a threshold number. The good thing with this one is you can do this with each one of the images. So you can actually batch a bunch of things and each image will have its own threshold that is more suited for that particular image. Okay. Remember to type any questions that you might have. All right, the mask. So the first thing that we want to do is we want to create a mask. The mask is going to say, where is, um, uh, where does the threshold is higher than than the threshold that we than, than the the image? All right. So where the image is greater than the threshold, then we're going to put the same value. If it's not greater than the threshold, we're going to put zero, right? And when they can plot the mass right here. Right. So it kind of you you can you don't see much the difference. But it, there is a lot more zeros. Let's plot the. The histogram is taking a lot longer. So I'm going to stop it. All right. Next, we're going to take that mask and instead of having it as an image, we're going to have it, we're going to have it as a, as a label. So just once, uh, two, three, four, five, you know, like a numeric label instead of an actual intensity. How does that look? It looks like this. So because it's sequential, so it, it starts here and ends here, like it kind of looks like if it was fading, it's not fading, it's just the, the numerical values. Okay. Uh there are other ways to I'm um, sorry, it's already five. Uh yeah, I'm going to try to finish uh, as, as soon as I can. Uh so I'm going to do it a little bit faster. Uh, I'm sorry for the ones that I need to leave. Thank you so much for being here. All right, so that's how it works. Now, you can fill holes. Like sometimes you can see little holes in here. In here we don't see them very much, but you can have them. So we're going to fill them with NDI binary fill holes. So those holes are actually completely uh, squished. And then we're going to use NDI also to transform that filled space. What it's going to do is it's going to make uh, the foreground versus the background even bigger. Um, then we're going to create, uh, that's going to create a distance. We're going to also get the coordinates for all the peaks that we have. And these peaks are going to be within 15 pixels of each other, right? So if there's two peaks within 50 uh, pixels, it's only going to return one. Uh, and then we're going uh, to create a mask. Uh, in this case, it's a Boolean mask, different than this mask that we had here. And then we pass the distance 
the markers, uh, which are the, the labels of that uh, peaks, uh, and the label mask uh, to create uh, the our watershed uh, segmentation. Okay, and this is what you have. You have the original image and you have the segmentation already there. Okay, there are better ways to visualize that. A start this, for example, have already um, a, a function that's called render label. Uh, and render label uh, allows you to overlay uh, the all the the mask the 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 segmentation into the underlying um, um, the underlying image. In this case, I'm using the channel one, which contains the cell mask, which is the um, the cellular cytosolic uh, uh, marker. Okay, and we can see that there are some issues. Right, we have here. Is there's a nick there? This one is probably a single um, thing that got split, and there are a lot of things that we that we could tune for this particular uh, thing. Okay. Now, how can we extract uh, data from the mask? So we have the region props. So if we run this one. Region props will take the labels, the intensity in the intensity image, and will return all the regions. Okay, so if I put regions, this is going to be a bunch of region props, which is each crop of each one of the <coughs> of the labels that in this case are nuclei. Okay, so the labels right here, where is it? Yeah, the, the ah, sorry, this is the nuclei. It's going to be the nuclear, right? And now uh, there is another way to do that. So if you don't want to to modify anything and you want, want to use the properties that it already exists in the library, for example, it's like it's in here, these properties, you can use the region prop cell table and pandas to read that table into a nice table with the label, the centroid, the area, the eccentricity, etc. So it's super simple to to deal with it, but you can actually. Um, um, uh, customize this as much as you want, uh, uh, looping over these particular regions. Okay, there's an exercise again. Uh, if you want to go ahead, uh, try with the data that they exist. There's a human mitosis um, data that you can use as well. Now, with segmented segmenting cells, we can, or actually we should, start with the nuclei. We know that the cells will start with the nuclei. So first, we're going to uh, uh, try to get a, a threshold. In this case, the threshold should be with the cells. I forgot to put it there, but it's basically the same thing, right? So we're going to get the optional threshold. But this case is going to be the cells. Uh, and let's lower it because we know that it's a little bit less. So 70. Ah, it's right here. I had it in the wrong spot. And then you have a watershed uh, thing. If we uh, do it with, with the segmentation, you can see it there. Sometimes it doesn't do a good job, but most of the time it does a fairly uh, okay job. So again, in this case, we just create a mask where the cells are um, greater than the than the threshold. We transform that into a distance uh, where the nuclei is equal to zero. Uh, then we create with that distance the the nuclei and the mass that we just created. We create the labels, uh, and those labels are our watershed um, segmentation. And we can then uh, get the same properties. Now, if you want cytos cytosolic, we can just remove one mask to the other, and then we just cut out the identified um, uh, nuclei from the cells. Okay, and then you create your regions property table for that particular one. So we have the regions prop for the nuclei, the region prop for the cytosol, right? There's also, again, an exercise where you visually compare the studies, uh, and I give you there the, the API um, web pages 
Uh, that's all. So any questions? I'm sorry I, I'm over time and there's not much time, but if you have any questions, please do ask them. Okay, so the question is, with this method, is it possible to count bacterial colonies present in a guard plate from a camera image and to extract area or another library is better? You can definitely do that with this one. Uh, it really will boil down to how much resolution you have on the camera, right? So if your microscope or your uh, any kind of microscope you have uh, can, if you can see by eye, basically, the the edges of the colonies or even the edges of the, of the actual bacteria, uh, then definitely you can you can use SK image by by all means. Uh, I believe that Celpo's Mesmer. I think Astartes does have train with some bacteria. I'm not entirely sure with uh, uh, Celpo's and Mesmer. I will always encourage you to test uh, first. Uh, how does he do with like really dumb uh, dummy variables? But yeah. You can definitely extract that, and you can extract multiple things uh, from it. You can extract the shape of the colony. You can, if you can see, kind of like uh, like how many colonies for starters, the shape of the colony. Uh, sometimes the colonies need to grow in a certain pattern, otherwise uh, the the colony is deceased. Uh, uh, so that can be also extracted from from the the blob of the colony. Yeah. Any other question? Now that I finish, you can also uh, unmute yourself if you want. Or you can keep writing. I'm happy to keep here. Otherwise, then. Pleasure. Uh, Phil had to uh, go to another uh, event, uh, personal event. So he asked me to close uh, uh, just as people are leaving. Uh, you'll be prompt to a form because we have credentials on Credly. So if you put your information there, you're going to have uh, credentials for participation on this. Uh, on this, uh, and as Phil said, in about a couple of months, uh, we're going to have the recording of this presentation available in our YouTube channel. Uh, it does take a couple of months for this to happen, mostly for editing and for. Um, uh, permissions to get all these things published. So thank you so much, Sergio. This was really interesting. I have a background in uh, image, uh, uh, you know, image processing for many years. And it's interesting to see a different way to do it. And uh, actually I'm quite interested in this uh, deep uh, learning ways to do it. I want to take a look at some of these um, uh, yeah, do, do, libraries do, do, do. And, and this training, so the training models that are there. So. Yeah, cool. Thank, thank you for, for helping me with, with this and yeah, see you around. Thank you, guys. Have a good evening. See ya.